I checked this morning and I was like, where the hell are the slides? Oh, it's too early there. So. trying to do presenting. presenting here we go i can share two loaded slides oh yeah there you go yeah oh you're doing it you can either one you can do it okay i'll, I'll just watch you have to hit mute okay yeah Hello all, we're about to get started. Hopefully people at remote can hear this. If someone remote can acknowledge, that would be awesome. Yay. There we go. Hopefully it's better now. So, if you are sitting in a room called Kensington and you do not see people, probably you are in Kensington 2 or Kensington 3, which is very confusing because when you first come up the stairs, you see Kensington and you walk in and it's not here. So, if there are not a bunch of people in the room with you, you're probably in the wrong place. Get up, walk down the passageway with all the glass, and then turn left. Alrighty. So, Hi, welcome to the Technology Deep Dives on Quick. I'm Warren. I'm Brian. And let's get to the next slide. This is the IETF note well. Um, we're the first sort of like official session, so it's entirely possible you have not seen this. You should probably read this and figure out what all it means and talk to legal, etc. if you don't know what it means. But yep, this is our IETF note well. And thank you everyone for showing up so early. Um, I realize it is ridiculously early. And also hello to everyone who is remote and here. And also hello to everybody who's gonna be watching this later on YouTube probably, or some remote thing. Video streaming service, Video streaming service of your choice. Alrighty, and with that done, let me hand it over to Brian. So um, I've, I've actually had this question in the hallway a lot. Uh, so do I have to come to the technical deep dive on Monday and on Tuesday? Well, that's really early both days. Um, it's even earlier on, on Tuesday, actually, at 7.30 tomorrow. And you know, I was asked, okay, that's a joke, right? No, I mean, it might be a joke, but it's also the truth. Um, the uh, agenda is split into sort of like two parts um, today is basically the basics of Quick, right? Gets you from, I have no idea what's going on here, or I've heard of Quick, or, you know, isn't that just the web over UDP? So having a basic technical understanding of, of what's going on in Quick. Jana will be talking uh, about the, you know, the basic introduction, a talk called The Future with Quick. And um, Martin will follow up on that with a talk about how Quick is layered and how that layering is a bit different from, you know, the intuition that you'll have from, you know, TCP over IP, et cetera, et cetera. Um, tomorrow, uh, we will go uh, uh, a bit deeper into a few topics. Uh, so this is really about, okay, now we have the basic fundamentals of Quick. Uh, let's talk about how that gets deployed at scale, how it is, is sort of like used in the internet now, uh, and things that we've learned uh, from running it at scale. Uh, so that'll be Ian, morning Ian. Uh, and Lucas, who I haven't seen yet, but he'll be here tomorrow. 
um, talking first about the deployments at scale and some of the things uh, that we've learned through that, and then like how uh, to uh, observe and debug applications on Quick. And with the rest of the time tomorrow, um, we will have a panel discussion with all of the speakers. So if you have like interesting questions, uh, please hold them till tomorrow. Come at you know 8:30 is when that should start, uh, and we'll have a panel up here uh, with people to answer your questions and have some discussion about Quick. So with that, I will stop talking and invite up Jonna Iyengar, who will talk about the future with Quick as soon as I bounce the slide share. Thank you, Brian. Do I have to stand in the spot? I think I do, no? I don't. I'm... We'll see if the camera follows me. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here early this morning. Hopefully, hopefully this talk will wake you up. If it doesn't, uh, I'll ask Martin to wake you up. But anyways, let's get started with this thing. Uh, are we doing question and answer? Are we doing Q&A alongside? What are we doing with Q&A? Uh, Q&A will be tomorrow. Will be tomorrow. So if you have any questions, write them down. You'll forget them through the day and ask us tomorrow or catch us in the corridors. So I'm going to start with just this brief agenda. It's basically, what is Quick? And uh, this is for, um, well, uh, and I'm going to talk about Quick's immediate value proposition. And I'm going to talk about really what does Quick enable. Next slide. So the subtext here is that the first piece is simply a short primer, a very, very short primer on Quick. I can't do more than that. Um, and we want to talk about how did we get the world interested in this? Like, what did we do to make the world interested in this, in this particular technology? And finally, what was the real goal? What was the thing that we were really wanting to do? What did we set out to do from the get-go? Um, next slide. So before I get going on to quick, who am I? I am uh, Jana Iyengar. I'm VP of Infrastructure and Network Services at Fastly. I am an editor of the IED of Quick Specifications. I'm a chair of the ICCRG, um, uh, IRTF's ICCRG research group. And I've worked on transport for, for way longer than I care to remember, and on Quick also for way longer than I care to remember. But that's me. Next. And now on to a short primer on Quick. Next slide. Um, I'm going to tell you this. This is going to be a very short primer. There's not going to be, uh, I don't have a lot of slides here talking about the details of the protocol, the details of the bits. We've done, I and others have done talks on these in various places. So if you go on YouTube and do a search, you'll find a bunch of these things. Um, so my goal here is not to go into the details of this, but to give you a, a, a base from where you can, you can dig in and, and get deeper. Um, but I'm just going to start off by saying Quick is a new transport protocol. Now, if you look at this picture, this sort of has a depiction, and, and Martin's going to come and uh, uh, thrash this picture and say, well, that's not quite how this works um, later. So that's, that's fun for later. But this is roughly a schematic understanding of where Quick sits in sort of the protocol stack, so to speak. Um, we have the TCP, TLS, and HTTP protocols in the traditional stack. And where Quick sits is basically uh, uh, parallel to TCP and TLS and some of HTTP. So yes, it's weird, but that was kind of the, the uh, it's not weird, it was just a compression of multiple layers, so to speak. And TLS sits sort of within Quick, but it's not within Quick. However, it sort of does sit within Quick in, in, in uh, depending on how exactly you look at it. Um, but that's sort of the layering picture here. It is deliberately uh, uh, compresses multiple layers and it deliberately sits at these, uh, in these spaces because the goal here was to accelerate and deploy something that we could for the web. Uh, next. So what are these, these features of Quick that really made it viable and useful for the web? Well, first, it's multi-streamed. Multi-streaming is a very powerful feature. It's a very powerful service. The idea here is that you get within one end-to-end -end connection, you get multiple um, ordered byte streams. Now, this is not just multiple ordered byte streams, it's a more general abstraction. Now, this works really well for the web because the web has, there are, every website has a lot of objects, they're all multiple, effectively uh, uh, parallel independent objects and so on. But uh, this is a more general abstraction. Streams are designed to be lightweight. 
They're designed to be built and toned down rapidly, efficiently. And if your implementation does it right, you can use this as even a message abstraction. So you can think about this as a uh, protocol that, in, that gives you a message abstraction in the form of streams. And for the transport nerds among you, you can build partial uh, ordering on top of this thing. Um, or you can build complete ordering inside this thing. So you have those degrees of freedom with multi-streaming. Next slide. Why is this on top of UDP? It's a question that people often ask. Um, we built this on top of UDP because UDP is what works on the internet today. If you want to build something new and deploy it, that's the way to do it. And that's what we did. Uh, now, this uh, doesn't necessarily mean that the protocol has to live in user space. However, remember that if you wanted to build something on top of IP, you are necessarily stuck to being inside the kernel. And that is a big problem for us also in terms of building, deploying, shipping things. So being on top of UDP gave us two significant benefits. One of them was that we could get through the internet as it, as it, as it is with middle boxes and firewalls and everything else. And it allowed us to deploy in user space. So those were two significant benefits, which is why we use them. However, it requires us to recreate a bunch of TCP functions on top of it. So we had to redo all the TCP functions on top of this, but we didn't simply redo them. We, uh, uh, we did a better job of doing them um, because we've learned from the past. We, we wanted to incorporate all of the learnings of TCP and we did. Um, and importantly, Quick has encryption baked in. This means data, everything that is carried by the quick protocol and quick headers are all protected and this uses TLS 1.3 for key negotiation and this is uh, uh, basically a really important premise uh, and I'll come back to this in a moment and again the, Martin's going to go into more detail on exactly how this is done uh, in, in, in quick but this was really important to us. Why was this important to us? Well, of course, it was important to us to protect the metadata. We know today that if you were to design a protocol that was not fundamentally protected, that seems like you're not learning the lessons of the past 20 years. So we did that. But there was an even more important lesson here, or an even more important reason for doing this. Um, middle boxes ossify protocols that are exposed. We did not want quick to be ossified. TCP is today ossified. Many other protocols that have been deployed in the wild in plain text are completely ossified. You cannot change them on the wire without seeing unexpected weird interactions with middle boxes that have ossified them or have certain expected behaviors, expect certain behaviors of them. God, that's the next room. Um, so with, sorry, go back one slide. Um, so with baking and encryption, what we were able to do is basically say that only the endpoints can really understand and change the metadata, the headers in the protocol, as well as the body. And that's an important, important thing because now middle boxes are unable to change the headers or to obfuscate or to, or to, or to mess with the headers or even read the headers. So they can't have any expected behaviors, which means that endpoints are free to change the protocol as they see fit. What this means is that Quick becomes evolvable. So when Quick gets deployed, it becomes evolvable. That was our goal, and that's why encryption is baked into Quick. Next slide. Um, so that is my rough inter introduction into Quick. And I'm sorry if you didn't see all the header bits that you wanted to see, and I don't want to do that here to you early in the morning on Monday. You're going to see plenty of, if you want header bits, walk into any room this week, you'll see plenty of those. Um, I'm going to talk to you about what Quick's immediate value proposition was. How did we get the world in? So this, these are the features, right? This is what I talked about. This is how we talk about Quick. Why did we get, how did the world get interested in Quick? Because, so Quick broke new ground in several ways. The first thing was the zero RTD transport and crypto handshake. Again, you're going to hear more about that after my talk. Um, and this is fundamentally difficult to do with TCP and the split TCP TLS models. You've got TLS sitting on top of TCP. They end up having different scopes. When I say different scopes, I mean scopes of identity, scopes in terms of where the connection gets terminated in the network. And that makes it fundamentally difficult to do something like zero RTD. 
people have argued people will say you know isn't it the same uh, isn't zero rtd in quick so before i talk about uh, the same as tcp what zero rtd and crypto handshake what what that gives you is a low latency uh, connection setup for those of you who have not been paying attention um, zero rtd means zero round trip time delay before data is uh, exchanged on a connection excuse me so um we've created a zero rtd trans transport and crypto handshake now tcp could do this with tcp fast open in tcp and with tls 1.3 and zero rtd in tls however because of the split model you still end up having different scopes you have tcp that doesn't understand domains certs things like that it understands only ip addresses tls operates in a different space and you have a split between an understanding of what the endpoint identity itself is at these two levels you can reconcile these things but there's a lot of nuance to work to be done there if you want to make this work in the split tcp model um next slide connection migration was another thing that we wanted for 20 25 years to build into transport technologies and we finally got it in and we were able to Uh, uh, build this into quick again this is fundamentally different to do with tcp in the split tls tcp model uh, in part because of the the endpoint identities but also in part because tcp we've done this with mptcp idf has done this with mptcp but i would again challenge you to think about what we should think of as our end goals we want this to get deployed everywhere with mptcp you still have to play nice with the operators with the network devices and so on i don't mean that we shouldn't play nice with the operators what i mean is that we can't wait for every operator and every middle box vendor to come on board before we consider a protocol deployed that is a very very long poll and that makes the tent unlivable in it's it's too long, too long a poll so um, that's basically uh, connection migration again we were we we've deployed it it's being used already next slide and we are able to build troubleshooting and debugging capabilities you want to hear about this a little bit more from lucas uh, tomorrow but uh, the the difference here is this um, the, the 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 value prop here is this right so with anybody who's anybody here who's done debugging kernel debugging anybody okay a fair number of hands excellent have you also done application debugging have you tried to correlate those traces <laughs> <laughs> that is a pain right so when you have certain application behavior and you go okay i've got application traces and you go okay now i need to grab the tcp traces or s trace or whatever it is that you need to do and you need to go down to the kernel and go all the way down the network path to figure out everything you are trying to use completely different pipelines built by completely different people for completely different use cases and try to correlate them S companies that have managed to successfully build those things have used them very very uh, effectively however it's not a small order it's difficult right so being in user space for uh, for quick basically gives you the ability to log it log transport network level traces alongside application level traces that is huge because you don't have to go around doing this uh, 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 separately you can log alongside the application traces you can log things like what is the congestion window value what is the state of the connection what happened when was when was streams created again you'll hear more about this from uh, lucas tomorrow who'll talk to you about um, about uh, logging uh, under the logging format that we're standardizing for quick here um but we get much significantly richer capabilities for doing this in user space next um so actually go back one i think may have missed oh right i meant to say this here there is a um uh, another really really cool thing which i you know i'll show at the end of today if you have time i'll demo it but one thing that you have a problem with for instance is is, is uh, if you have poor behavior at the client side for instance it's you can grab client side packet traces or you can report it to the server side who whomever is at the server and you can say hey you know go dig into this particular trace i give you an identifier for a connection for instance go find out what happened with that connection why was it behaving poorly you have no other recourse and on the server side what we would do at the server side is generally we end up having to uh, uh find your connection now that is an impossibility 
usually finding a connection in the fleet of servers that we have and so on is super difficult to do. And it's uh, uh, and then go trace it, track it, find the where the client is connected. It's really difficult to do. Um, what we were able to wouldn't it be cool if the client could basically ask the server and say, hey, can you just send me your view of our connection over the connection that we have right now? Like your packet trace for my connection, just send it to me over the same connection that we already have. That is what we built. Uh, and we were able to do that. Next slide. I'm not going to show you this demo right now because it's a bit tricky to get going. Um, but the links are here. Go to the video only uh, link and then go to the self trace link using the same browser window, meaning that you'll have a connection going over the, you'll have a stream going over the same connection. And that only works, of course, if you're using Quick. And I'm happy to show it to you later uh, if I can get it going. So this is uh, 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 really, really valuable. At the client, you're able to see a server's uh, packet trace. Now, uh, um, I'm going to move to the next thing, which is transforming server architecture. So I won't go into the details of this, um, but Deg server return is an ability for a server to be able to hand off a request to another server and have that server serve the user directly. So it's sort of like if, if a client requests a resource from a server, the server doesn't have the resource, but knows another server that has it, is able to sort of kick the connection over or the request over and have the response served directly from there. This is called direct server return. It's called direct server return because normally what, what, ends, what commonly happens and the easier way to solve this problem of I don't have the content somebody else does is client connection to the server, server connects to the other server, receives the content, serves it back. So there's a full uh, uh, path back. Instead, you bypass this intermediating server on the return path. That's called direct server return. We were, we were able to design this in Quick, and, and some of us have been designing, building this into, into our server infrastructures. And the reason we were able to do this is because in Quick, again, in terms of how we build the transport protocol itself, we were able to separate the sender's view from the receiver's view of the world. And uh, in this particular case, uh, that plays very nicely, allows us to actually build something like direct server return. We can have multiple servers sending with one receiver receiving. This is, again, fundamentally difficult to do in TCP. Next slide. So this is how we got the world interested. These are the different things. These are the different benefits that we brought out. And, we, when, and, and this is how all of us got excited about Quick and so on. But I'm going to now talk about what Quick is enabling. Right. Next slide. What does Quick enable? So Quick enables multiple new technologies that you can build within Quick. So you can hear about, you know, you won't hear these experiments today, but maybe tomorrow. Uh, you're gonna, uh, there are new condition controllers that you can easily build and deploy. I know that Meta's done this, Google's done this, Fastly, we've done this. So there it's, it, it makes it much, much e easier to deploy these things in, 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 in quick than it has been in DCP. Next slide. If you've not heard about mask, um, Mask basically employs HTTP3 and Quick to create hidden tunnels, right? And this is something that you can, again, Quick is enabling this technology. Was it possible before? Yes, but this makes it much more efficient, much uh, uh, um, more performant and also more efficient at the server stacks to be able to deploy uh, uh, something like tunneling. Um, and this is not just, I'm not just saying, talking about things here that could be built. This has been built. If you've heard of Apple's private relay, iCloud private relay, that basically uses mask extensively and it carries a ton of bytes today. If you have an iPhone and you've turned it on, you're using mask, you're using HTTP3 and quick to do this today. Next slide. And finally, media over quick, uh, or what I call the new world for WebRTC refugees. Um, is, is, is a proposal to do media directly over Quick. And that's again, Quick is enabling these technologies now to happen because it has, it's, it's feature rich enough that you can actually think about doing more interesting things directly with the transport. Next slide. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna offer that the real value of Quick was something else. Next. So, Quick, I, I've told you that the Quick makes the web faster, more resilient, more responsive. 
But this is just the beginning. Next slide. Quick enables these technologies I talked about. So it, it becomes a platform for these new technologies, MOQ, mock, mask, other stuff that we want to deploy. Next. And I've also told you that Quick is a transport technology that can be evolved on the internet. Because we manage to encrypt everything, we can evolve this thing going forward. It is already continuously evolving and multiple versions of Quick already exist in parallel on the internet today. And next slide. I'm going to offer that we've pulled a slate of hand. We basically convinced everybody that these are the reasons we wanted to deploy this thing. HTTP was the reason. And uh, getting these, these milliseconds of latency improvement and these features were the reasons. But next, we uh, used HTTP and the web as a vehicle to deploy Quick into almost serve, all server and client deployments. The Quick is deployed now widely. It also, it, 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 almost every server deployment has Quick in it. Almost every client, browser, and other client uh, libraries, they all have Quick in them now. Next. But our goal really was to create an end-to-end -end transport that allowed for end-to-end -end transports and technologies to thrive through an ossified internet. And I would say that we've, we, are the, we are sort of somewhere, not at the beginning of this journey. We managed to get somewhere. Hopefully, we'll get to the end of the journey. But we are certainly uh, much farther along than I thought we would get to. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jana. Next up, we have Martin, who will be showing us some header diagrams, I think. There's no header diagrams in this slide. It's supposed to be. All right. So, Dex, coming. All right. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about the quick handshake and, uh, and in particular, some of the security properties. Uh, security being one of the sort of primary drivers behind building this thing. Uh, do you have a clicker? I, yes, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Oh, lovely. Have a non All right, well, clicker. next slide then. Clicker is to say next slide and yeah. that I catch your cues. So there's a couple of things in here. I may not get to uh, some of the later things in any real detail, uh, but uh, that layering diagram that uh, Jonah was talking about, I think we'll spend a little bit of time on that. Uh, Quite possibly the most difficult part of getting Quick working was integrating the, the TLS handshake into Quick. There is a, something of a, a tight interaction between those, those two pieces, and it turned out to be extraordinarily fiddly. And uh, we were given a protocol um, from the work of the folks at Google who had designed their own cryptographic handshake, and it was broken in tiny, subtle, and very significant ways that required years of work to get to work. So next slide, please. So you've seen uh, what is, I think, the, the standard reference point for how we think about layering in Quick. Uh, there's this little TLS slice that's sort of jammed in on the Quick layer, and this is something that uh, I think makes people who like their nice layer cakes um, a little uncomfortable. Um, and we'll explain why that's the case as we get through this one. Next slide, please. So um, at a very high level, quick connection setup does everything that TCP does and everything that TLS does all sort of integrated together. And we did that for a number of reasons. I think the, the primary one being performance. So um, what we wanted to do was avoid replicating a lot of the security work. It turns out that building a good uh, security handshake is extraordinarily difficult, and TLS 1.3 is the result of a number of years of work, and we didn't want to have to redo all of that work because we're also building all of the TCP bits entirely on top of UDP, which is an entirely new protocol, and that's more than enough work. And it turned out to be even more work than we anticipated when we, we came into this. So the way you think of this is that TLS provides all of the cryptographic assurances that you might expect from a, uh, a protocol. Uh, and Quick provides all the things that, that TCP would provide, being reliable ordered delivery. And in turn, they each provide services to the other. Uh, TLS requires ordered reliable delivery. 
quick requires a secure handshake. Next, please. So we're taking the core TLS guarantees, authentication, confidentiality, integrity, and all of the core TCP guarantees at the handshake level. Now, um, other people can talk about streams and, and the various application semantics that we're providing quick, which include some of the core TCP guarantees, like in order reliable delivery. But um, for the handshake, there's uh, a lot of the things around the TCP handshake that I think weren't in the original versions of TCP, but ultimately TCP needed to have, which are things like being assured that the other side that you're talking to is willing to talk to you, uh, for instance. And that turns out to be an extraordinarily important part of the design of QUIC. And we'll talk about that look, as much as we can. The other thing is we were looking to do better than any of these protocols. We have a new protocol that we, we are implementing here. We took every opportunity we could to make things better. And I'll touch on a few of those points as we go through. Next, please. So uh, RTTs. Uh, TLS 1.3 is optimistic in the sense that a client will guess what configuration will work for a server. And that will, in the case that the guess is correct, save a round trip time. Quick does the same thing. A typical handshake in TLS is a sort of three-way exchange. You, you have the client send a message, the server respond, and then the, then the client finishes that off with a confirmation message. If the client guesses wrong, you have another round trip added to that. And one of the sort of themes that we'll have with Quick is that it has a very short handshake if everything goes correctly, but it turns out that you can add multiple round trips if you have packet loss, the client guesses wrong, the server is under duress and wants to tell the client to back off and, and wait a little long, while longer. And so um, we have this very flexible handshake, ultimately. The um, key insight is we, we have sort of this, this multiple round trip handshake. And, and I, I say here the typical handshake is 1.5 RTT. In practice, I think the messages we exchange is two round trip times. But under normal circumstances, if the client guesses correctly and the server is willing to communicate with the client, we can send data from either side after that first exchange between the client and server. We're actually sending before the handshake is complete. And in the extreme case, if the client has been to that server in the past and set up the zero round trip time thing, the, there is no delay for either end. The client sends immediately, application data is flowing immediately as the handshake is commenced. Same on the server end. As soon as the client, as the server sees the client's first message, it can start sending things to the client as well. And these performance guarantees were sort of central to the appeal of, of, of Quick, and, and they're the core of the performance guarantees that we're providing here. Next. So this is what the TLS handshake looks like. We have some key agreement and configuration that is exchanged more or less in the clear and then some authentication information. And you can sort of see here, we've got these lighter lines that say where, where the data is being exchanged. The, there's a flow from the client. There might be some, some application data fo following after that one. There's a flow from the server. There might be some application data. And then finally, at the end, some more messages, lots, lots more data at that point. Next, please. That's what happens when you put TLS on top of it. And um, there's a little note there saying that we, we had to tweak TLS in order to get this to work. And that's going to be a bit of a theme as we get into this one. Next. So um, the, the quick handshake sort of takes the TLS handshake and builds on top of that. TLS messages have essentially uh, four types of keys that, that are used. Um, and um, the no key in the case of uh, TLS is turned into a real set of keys in quick. So we have what we call initial keys, which are not secure in any meaningful sense, but they uh, provide us protection against ossification to, to the points that John was talking about before. Every single version of, of quick uses a different set of keys. If you don't know the keys, you can't speak that version of quick. It's sort of a, a, a nice little protection against someone who might be inclined to interfere with the handshake, um, but if they don't know the version of Quick that's being, being spoken, they don't get to, to interact. 
TLS also provides handshake keys. Those handshake keys uh, protect the, the details of the handshake. Uh, the security guarantees there are very, very interesting. Um, those of you who know TLS will perhaps have a better idea of what those properties are, but essentially we're providing confidentiality for things like the server certificate and a lot of the configuration parameters that the, the protocol has. The um, TLS bytes are put into specific frames um, within the packets. So we have packets with frames in them. The packets are protected with these keys. And we, we put multiple packets in the one UDP datagram, as it turns out. And uh, quick, after many iterations between first going with something that was based on DTLS, because why not? DTLS does UDP. Turns out to be a bad idea. Um, we went to TLS um, and TLS exporters for, for getting keys. Ultimately, what Quick does is runs the TLS handshake, and then when TLS produces keys, Quick reaches in, takes those keys out, and uses it for packet protection. TLS doesn't. Uh, TLS record protection isn't engaged in, in this. The raw bytes coming out of the handshake of, of TLS are used directly by Quick. So the final two types of keys we have. Uh, zero RTT keys, which the client uses to send to the server if it happens to be attempting zero RTT. And then the final application data keys, which are used for everything once the handshake is completed. We also have a key update process that, that rotates those keys periodically uh, to, prevent, to prevent them from wearing out. Next, please. So this is what the simplified handshake looks like. We have the client sending an initial packet which contains a crypto frame, which contains a TLS client hello. And on the server end, we have an initial packet and that contains a crypto frame that contains a server hello. And that is all effectively sent in the clear, although we're using these special quick version specific keys that are generated. The, um, the interesting thing to observe here is that there is a flow that goes from the client to the server and back again in the clear and then in the opposite direction for handshake keys, there's a flow that goes from the server to the client and back again using those handshake keys. And then finally, there is application data flowing from that point onwards. Now, this is a quirk of TLS, but um, what you will actually see here is the, the, there's a final message that confirms the handshake is done at the bottom there that the server sends once it's received everything from the client. And we spent years trying to avoid putting this message in. It turns out to be absolutely crucial in uh, a number of scenarios. We had the worst problem with handshake deadlocks and all sorts of weird corner cases before we decided, look, let's just put another message in here. What this means is ultimately this is a two round trip protocol. You can see two round trips on this, on this uh, diagram here, but you're sending data a lot sooner than that. And that's one of the weird things about operating this protocol. Next, please. Of course, all of this integrates with QUIC. And so QUIC, underneath all of this, is providing acknowledgements for all of the data that's being exchanged uh, back and forth here. And so that's what you see here is that every single message that is sent is acknowledged using packets protected by the same types of keys for various reasons that should be obvious. You can't acknowledge something with a different key because, well, maybe the other side doesn't have that key yet. And so um, there's this weird interlocking thing that, that goes on here, um, including some implicit acknowledgements in, in, in certain cases, which gets a little bit interesting as well. But um, this is to sort of illustrate that that Quick is providing all of the transport reliability features that uh, TLS requires. TLS sends very large messages that, that need to be sent and received in a very particular order. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. And Quick provides those, those facilities. Next, please. So this is ultimately what we have in terms of the layering diagram. And I think um, thinking about layering in the classic sense where you have a protocol that sits on top of another protocol doesn't really work for quick. The, uh, 
the key thing to realize here is it's more like a, a software architecture diagram where there are certain components that provide different capabilities and they have interactions with other components. Uh, you, if you think of the TLS stack as taking handshake messages and returning handshake messages and then providing information about state changes and the, the various secrets that it might be generating, then you have the ability to, to, to build a, a component that then sits inside the greater protocol. And so you have crypto streams responsible for exchanging those handshake bytes back and forth. And then you have a packet protection layer that takes uh, the, the packets that you're sending to the, to the other side and takes the secrets from TLS and uh, protects those packets or removes protection from those packets. And then of course, all of the things that we concretely care about uh, in terms of streams and ultimately uh, the quick datagram work as well is, is sort of sitting in there providing more frames that, that can be exchanged back and forth. So this is, this is what I tend to think of as the, the, the ideal uh, structure of, of quick on the, on the inside. And uh, it's not that simple, but uh, this is a gross simplification of that. Next, please. So the other part of all of this is actually mostly new in the protocol. We've taken inspiration from, from protocols that preceded it, TCP and, and other things. But um, the de denial of service mitigations in quick as part of the handshake and later are somewhat more interesting than the software engineering exercise of getting a quick uh, TLS stack crammed in. So uh, we have a few basic rules. Um, we had a long debate a little while ago about where this number three came from. Uh, and no one knows uh, concretely. We had a num number of people involved in the design of this and none of them can remember where the number three comes from. But there's, a, there's this basic rule that we follow in Quick is if you're sending to an address that you haven't confirmed is willing to receive the packets that you're sending, only send three times as much data to that as what you've received from that apparent address. So your yeah, random packet appears from the internet from some arbitrary address, uh, you can send three packets in response, no more. There's an address validation process that um, we use to say, send to that address and get confirmation that that address is live and willing to receive the packets that you're sending to it. And we have multiple types of address validation in Quick because of the way that we design the handshake and ultimately I'll touch on this later, migration. And um, really what we wanna do here is ensure that Quick is not used as a platform for denial of service attacks against un unwitting and unwilling victims on the internet. It turns out that we don't want to be memcache. <laughs> and uh, that's probably not such a pretty important, ultimately, uh, for, for making sure that everything works properly. Next, please. So the, the basic uh, handshake amplification attack is that uh, a client sends an initial packet that happens to have zero RTT in the same datagram. You can put a request in the same packet as your your initial thing. That might be a totally valid packet that uh, a server would accept under normal circumstances. It might be very happy to accept that packet from the client. But if the client manages to spoof the address, the return flow from the server, which contains all of the quick handshake information and potentially the answer to the question that they asked, could be very large. And the poor victim who genuinely owns that address might find themselves on the receiving end of, of a large flood of packets from a very well connected server. We don't want this to happen. So next slide, please. So TCP solved this, I think, a long time ago. I don't know when that was, but it was before I was involved in any of this. And it has a three-way handshake. Uh, of course, when we're doing TLS and TCP, that's, this adds a, an extra round trip to the setup, uh, which is, a little annoying, that's 
slows things down a little bit. But essentially, uh, TCP confirms this willingness to communicate before you start doing any of the TLS stuff. Uh, but in Quick, we put this all together. So we're doing the cryptographic handshake and this com confirmation to communicate all at once. And of course, um, not every Quick server is willing to uh, participate in all of this extra work before confirming that someone on the other end is actually willing to talk to them. So we added a retry mechanism, which is very much like the TCP SYN SYNAC um, with the cookies. The same cookies. Next, please. Uh, this looks approximately like this. Like this. Uh, the client sends a, a packet, and maybe some extra packets, and the server says, hey, uh, no. Uh, please confirm before proceeding. And it sends the client a token. And if the client's a genuine to uh, client, it will receive that token and can stick it in the packet that it generates for the next attempt, and everything moves, moves on from there. And the server has now received confirmation that the client is able to receive the messages that the server is sending and the client is willing to participate in the protocol. That's nice. Next, please. Retry, of course, is probably not something that you want to do because you're adding a round trip time to the connection setup. Uh, it is particularly good for cases where the server is under stress and they want to make sure that every client is genuine. And if they're under attack, then, then it might be, might be a good way to, to manage that. Or if you think that the traffic is coming from somewhere that is unreliable for various reasons, the reputation systems that you have indicate that it may be a little, little shonky. Uh, but that round trip is expensive. So we have some tricks for the case that uh, the handshake is, is um, shorter. Next, please. So what we need to do is prove to the server that the client saw the server initial packet. How do we do that? Um, it's very simple. The first exchange that happens in the clear uh, between the client and server establishes some cryptographic, key, cryptographic keys, and it does that based on information in those packets. The next set of packets from the client, these handshake packets, use those cryptographic keys to generate new uh, packet protection keys. If the client produces a valid handshake packet, that is because it saw everything that the server produced. And so we, we have what, what, uh, what amounts to an implicit token at that point. And um, until this point, the, um, the, the three, in, three out for, for one in rule applies. But um, next slide will show you um, the same thing that you saw before, but as the initial um, from the server reaches the client, the client generates some new cryptographic keys to protect the handshake packets. That Handshake packet is proof that the client saw the server keys. And so that allows us to proceed by layering in the um, address validation process without paying any extra bytes at all. I hope that's, that's clear, but that's uh, a, a trick that we apply in a couple of other places. Next, please. Um, oh, but of course, um, that, that goes both ways. The server needs to prove that it saw the client initial as well. So server needs to, the client needs to confirm that the server is willing to talk to it. And uh, at this point, we have a little trick. The key, these initial keys that I told you have a version specific thing are actually derived based on what we use, uh, uh, what we call a connection ID. And that connection ID is an unguessable value from the client. And so when the server responds using that connection ID or using keys derived from that connection ID, then the, the client can confirm that the server is willing to talk to it. So not only has the server proven that it understands the version of Quick that's being involved, it's also proving that it's willing to talk to the client by responding to it in this way. And uh, that retry thing that we talked, talked about before, we need to have the same sort of mechanism there. That has a different mechanism for, for managing that, that same process, but there's an integrity check in there as well. Next. So that's the, the implicit token that we have on the server side. Next. Okay, yeah, so uh, all of this is somewhat fiddly to get right. Uh, there were a lot of deadlocks that we discovered in the process, I think we spent what, the better part of two years going back and forth over some of the, the more tricky ones. 
Uh, certain people had a very good habit of finding new ones every time we thought we fixed them. Um, one thing that is still a little point of like discomfort for some of us is that we ha don't really have any formal verification to support the correctness of the, of the handshake. Um, we've spoken to academics about this one and, and there are systems out there that might, might be able to prove these sorts of things, but it's, it's rather challenging. Um, and I didn't even talk about version negotiation, uh, which adds even more complexity, but I won't talk about the, uh, that here because uh, we don't have the time. Next, please. Uh, brief uh, on migration. The migration process follows the same three out for every one in rule. Um, we have migration for a number of reasons. Uh, probably the most interesting one is a client that uh, is sitting behind a NAT and they get given an address and they happily talk to a server back and forth and then they go quiet for a little while because, well, they just don't have anything to say at that point. And when they restart the communication after that brief period, the NAT has decided that it's going to give it a different IP address on that flow. And so what the server sees is a message from the client that has a new IP address that is completely unvalidated. And that could be maybe an attack. And so uh, if it were to continue sending large amounts of data to that new address, bad things might happen because that might be spoofed. Of course, in a lot of cases, most cases, in fact, it's just the NATs doing what NATs do. Next, please. So we want to deal with NAT binding changes. We want to allow connections to move to new paths even, uh, legitimately. Uh, but we also want to ensure that the, uh, an attacker can't force someone to move if they don't want to move. Uh, we also want to ensure that an attacker can't stop someone from moving if they want to move. And um, unfortunately, if, you, if, if we were to show you a, an IP and UDP uh, packet header, they're not protected. And the network rewrites them all the time. In fact, to some extent, we kind of rely on the network being able to rewrite these things. Maybe that was a bad idea, but uh, that's the network that we have. And so um, we're in this kind of really awkward situation. So next slide, please. There we go. So migration looks like this. You have an established connection between client and server. And maybe the, an attacker takes one of your packets. Maybe it's a packet that you had dropped and sends it from a new address. The server looks at this packet and says, hmm, I'm not sure about this one. This might be legitimate. I don't know. And so what it does is probes that address saying, here's a, here's a token, prove to me that you're live on this address. But it also, and this took a long time to realize, um, it also sends a probe to the old address and says, prove to me that you're at this address. The client just responds to these probes as it sees them. If it's legitimately uh, moving to the new address, then it will respond from the new address and proceed. If it's still on the old address and the attacker decided that it wanted to force the client to migrate to a new path, then uh, the attacker should be unable to pr produce the, uh, the, re the correct response. And um, whichever one wins, whichever one's legitimate, will produce a response that the server will then respect and uh, valid migration will proceed. Next, please. So in order to get this to work, we didn't want to solve the problem that uh, ICE solves. So only clients can migrate at this, at, at, in this version of Quick anyway. Uh, servers can ask clients to migrate, but only once. Uh, we have this thing that happens during the handshake that, that allows it to happen. But clients are the ones that initiate the process. Um, migration is very simple um, in, at some levels. Uh, you simply detect that an address has changed on the other end and you start sending data to that address. But you only follow, you follow the three times rule uh, until you've managed to validate that. 
and uh, the validation process was on the previous slide. Next, please. And I think we're up. Uh, so having this very simple three times anti-amplification rule applies to all addresses. Uh, it's uh, pretty straightforward to, to apply. Uh, you need to validate all paths before you speak on them. Uh, and uh, simplifying to the client only means that we uh, don't end up with complications in the, in the protocol state machine where both sides decide to migrate at the same time, which doesn't really work very well. Um, and then that leads into a whole set of other design problems where we use connection IDs on different paths. But when I haven't spoken about connection IDs and probably shouldn't because I don't have time. Next. So that's only sort of a taste of all the security relevant things. Uh, we could probably spend another couple of hours talking about how packets are protected, uh, how the packet header is protected, which was an interesting story there. Uh, key rotation uh, is, a, is a part of that. We also provide a, an equivalent to a TCP reset, uh, which we call a stateless reset. Uh, that allows a server that, that loses state to clear up any connections that might be hanging around from, from before when it lost that state. Um, that is secure. So um, TCP resets cannot be injected by the network. Um, we also have a whole version negotiation thing that is nearing publication. Um, that requires a whole lot of interesting discussions as well, but uh, not enough time to cover all those things here today. And that's me done. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I think my favorite thing that I learned today after, you know, having stared at Quick for most of its development is that nobody knows where that 3x rule came from because I dug into it a little bit too. <laughs> that, was, that was Ian. Ian did it. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> Two isn't big enough. Two, yeah. <laughs> Two's not big and enough. Four right? is too many. And four is too many. Well, no. Well, four might be okay, but four is not right. great. <laughs> Honestly, no one really knows. Uh, I, it, it was pulled out of the air, I think. Yeah. And it seems right. All right. Yeah. Uh, so Ian knows. Talk to Ian. Ian knows. Talk to Ian. Ian talk will. To Ian. Ian will talk about that tomorrow as to where that three three X. Oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Cool. So um, thank you all very much for being with us um, so early this morning. Uh, thanks especially to our speakers. Um, excellent, excellent, excellent presentations. Uh, we hope to see all of you and more tomorrow morning at 7.30, uh, not at 8. We have a little bit of extra time for the panel discussion, and we ran early as opposed to running late on that one. Um, so yes, thank you all very much, and enjoy your IETF. Thank <laughs> you.